Hey y'all, Dr. Brown back again with another thrilling video, this time about the histology of the stomach. So just in case you haven't had anatomy, or you haven't had anatomy in a hot minute, just a reminder, the stomach is this uh, pouch-like extension of the alimentary canal, and it's located kind of to, mostly to the left of the midline and the superior portion of the abdominal cavity. And the stomach can be divided into four primary distinct regions. So we have the cardia, or cardiac region. That is the region where the esophagus meets the stomach. We have the fundus, which is the superior kind of distension of the stomach. And you'll find that there are other organs that have kind of a superior hump on them called a fundus. And then the main part of the body, sorry, the main part of the stomach is called the body. So we see that right here. And then this is divided into the two parts of the pylorus. So the pyloric antrum and pyloric canal are both parts of the pylorus or pyloric region of the stomach. And that's simply where it narrows down as it meets the proximal most portion of the small intestine. Histologically, the stomach is very different from any of the other primary digestive organs. So what we're going to do is look at a cartoon of stomach histology first and kind of go over the, the general features and then we'll actually look at real micrographs and see how those four layers, and it's actually not all four, but two of them in particular, are modified to enable the stomach to do its job of chemical and mechanical digestion of swallowed food. So the first thing you'll notice about the mucosa of the stomach is that the epithelium and the lamina propria are not in a nice kind of wavy single layer like we saw in the esophagus. Instead, the epithelium and lamina propria of the mucosa are invaginated or pulled downward into kind of a pocket so that you can see up here at the surface we have these kind of holes and then in cross-section we can see these holes lead down into this invagination of the epithelium. So most of the epithelial surface area is not exposed to the lumen of the stomach, which is full of gastric juice. And gastric juice is this combination of primarily hydrochloric acid, very powerful digestive enzymes, and mucus. Um, I like to call it murder juice. It's got a pH of anywhere from 1 to 3 and it uh, contains very powerful protein, proteases. And I don't know if you guys have checked, but you're kind of made out of proteins. So a lot of the modifications we're going to see in the mucosa are a trade-off between needing to make these substances that can digest meat and dealing with the fact that we're made out of meat and therefore could be digested with these things. And so the first kind of adaptation to that is the folding inward of the gastric epithelium into these gastric pits up here and then the gastric glands, which are what line these invaginations of the epithelium. Up at the top of the gastric pit, you'll see it's largely covered with surface epithelial cells, and these surface epithelial cells are primarily mucus-secreting cells. So there's always going to be kind of a, a thin layer of protective mucus covering the parts of the stomach that are actually coming into contact with the gastric juice. As we move down into the gastric glands, we see some of the cells that actually produce the gastric juice. Ja ah, gastric juice, I can't say words. So the first of these is the parietal cell seen here. These cells are very large. They tend to stain red, red in standard histological preparations. And these are the cells that are producing both the hydrochloric acid and a substance called intrinsic factor which is necessary for the absorption of vitamin B12. Then on down we have our chief cells, and these contain little granules called zymogen granules. And the zymogen granules are going to become active protease enzymes once they reach the acidic environment of the lumen, right? We keep them inactive until we get out of here and up into here where we have some protection from that gastric juice, then the acid in the gastric juice can, can, turn, can turn the zymogen into enzymes such as pepsin. And then finally, down here in the bottom part of these gastric glands, we see some enteroendocrine cells. Now these are also often called G cells, and they're called that because enteroendocrine means they're creating digestive hormones, 
And the hormone that's produced uh, most often and the most well, well known initially was gastrin. So these are gastrin secreting cells. They're also called G cells. We now know, in fact, that they're also secreting the hormone somatostatin. So enteroendocrine cell is a more appropriate name for them. All right, we've seen it in a cartoon. Now let's actually see these things in real life. Let's look at some actual histological preparations. So here we can see a very low mag image of the stomach, but we can already make out some of those distinctive features that I mentioned in the last picture. So here we can see the gastric pits, right? And you notice these surface epithelial cells have a very distinct appearance. They are essentially goblet cells. These are columnar mucus secreting cells, and they're going to be making the mucus layer that's going to protect everything up here. As we move downward into the gastric glands, we see some cells known as mucus neck cells. So these little patches of darker cells down here and here, they're kind of small and very dark staining. They're very basophilic. And these little guys are going to be producing more mucus, and they're going to be protecting the more delicate tissues further down in the gastric glands. So here you can see a gastric gland chirp, 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 coming down. So just outline this little gastric gland as we come down. Now keep in mind these are three-dimensional structures, so you see it appears to end here, and that's probably because we're looking at a two-dimensional section, and part of it either went away from us or toward us. Now you can also see as you move downward, so from the surface of the mucosa deeper down toward the lamina propria, that the epithelial cells appear to change color, and that's because the parietal cells, like this is mostly in here, parietal cell, these tend to be more eosinophilic, so they're a redder color. And then the uh, chief cells, lower down, are going to be more purpley uh, or blue. So we can kind of see this trend even at this low mag image. But let's go up in magnification and look even closer at these gastric glands. So in this higher magnification image, we can see the distinctive surface epithelial cells up at the top. And I'm probably going to need a different colored pen than red for this, so let's go ahead and switch to... Uh, we'll go back to black. Boop. And then as we move downward, we can see some of the mucus neck cells down in here. And then we very distinctly see the parietal cells. So, you know, these guys are parietal cells. They're large, they're red, they tend to be pretty round. You can see they're, they're fairly circular in shape. And further down still, we see the blue chief cells. So if you get a really good section, at a good magnification, it's not really hard to distinguish between the parietal cells higher up in the gastric glands and the chief cells lower down in the gastric glands. What is hard to see in a typical stomach is the enteroendocrine cells, and that's because they're fairly rare. So if we look closer, we can see a very distinct parietal cell here with its characteristic central nucleus and red or pink staining, and then we can also see a couple of chief cells right here, and you notice that they tend to be more columnar cells, their nuclei tend to be more basal down toward the bottom of the cell, and of course they stain more purple or blue. You still can't see any enteroendocrine cells in here. Like I said, they're kind of hard to spot, so what we're going to do is cheat a little bit. This is a section through a stomach with somebody who has, I think it's called G-cell sarcoma, but it's cancer where you produce too many enteroendocrine cells. So since this person has essentially G-cell cancer, we can see a G-cell here. I'm going to switch back to red so it's easier to see. So these large kind of distended cells with the centrally located nuclei, but they're not parietal cells. They don't, they're, they're not red in color. These are the enteroendocrine cells. So like I said, these are harder to find uh, unless you have a patient with G-cell cancer. Up next, we're going to look at the other layer that's heavily modified. So we've seen so far how the mucosa is modified with its infolded epithelium and lamina propria, with the stratification of the cells so that we have the surface epithelial cells and the mucous neck cells closer to the caustic environment of the gastric juice, then the parietal cells making the hydrochloric acid, and then the chief cells even further down making the zymogen granules, which don't become active until they hit the hydrochloric acid, which is going to be higher up. So this is going to protect our underlying tissues. The lamina propria is folded. The muscularis mucosa is about the same as in any other organ. The submucosa is about the same, but muscularis externa is also modified rather heavily in the stomach. 
So if we look at the muscularis externa, you can see in the cartoon on the left, we have a longitudinal layer, right? That's the outermost layer. Got it. Check. We got a circular layer. We're also used to seeing that. But what we're not used to seeing is this innermost oblique layer. So there's a third layer of smooth muscle in the muscularis externa of the stomach. And while it's not easy to see, I think once I point it out, you'll be able to see the distinction. In the micrograph on the right, you can see right about here is the borderline between the oblique layer above and the circular layer below. So this is circular. And then finally, we can see one more transition. And then the longitudinal layer is down here. So the the modifications to the mucosa are largely to facilitate chemical digestion of the ingested food. The acid will denature proteins, opening up their, sec their uh, tertiary and secondary structures so that the protease enzymes can get in there and break the proteins up into smaller pieces. The modifications to muscularis are going to facilitate mechanical digestion, having that third layer of smooth muscle running at a 45 degree angle to the other two is going to allow the stomach to exhibit a characteristic motion called churning, which is going to allow it to really work those digestive enzymes into the chewed and swallowed food, creating an acidic paste called chyme, which will then exit the stomach via the pyloric canal and be further chemically digested by enzymes in the proximal portion of the small intestine. So that's about it for now. We've seen how we modify those layers in the stomach to allow the stomach to be a stomach and not an esophagus and not a small intestine. That's it for now. Uh, study hard. We'll see you later.